Hi, this is Catherine Morgan from Point A to Point B Transitions, and welcome to this episode of Evolving Working. I am a career transition expert and business consultant to consultants, and today I'm joined by my co-host, Susan Eckstein. Hi, everybody. I'm Susan Eckstein. I'm a women's empowerment expert, certified coach, facilitator, and a speaker. And in a nutshell, I help women stop shrinking so they can have the confidence to be seen, be heard, and take up space. And today we are joined by my friend and colleague, Heather Bennett. Heather, tell us a little bit about your background. Um, hi, Catherine. Susan, it's so nice to see both of you, and thank you so much for having me on. Uh, my background, I have an MBA. I'm also certified as a board of directors member and qualified to serve. Um, in addition, I've spent the last 20 something years uh, as a business and career coach, primarily for executives and entrepreneurs. And your corporate background was in? Uh, my corporate background before that was in uh, consumer packaged goods. So I've worked for some of the probably companies that you all have products in your house right now for. Beloved household brands. Exactly. So women on the board of directors for companies is a topic that is so current right now. And for whatever reason, my feeds that I follow are not talking about this enough or in the way that I was hoping to talk about it. Mm -hmm. So between Susan's expertise in women's empowerment and the fact that you are currently seeking board positions and recently got certified to be on boards, even though you're probably totally qualified before your certification, I want to dive into it. But I want to set the stage just really quickly that the NASDAQ has said that companies of a certain size need to disclose if they do not have at least two diverse members of their board. And that's interesting. And then there's some recent statistics from um, the women accounted for 45% of new board appointments for Fortune 500 companies in 2021, according to Hydric and Struggles uh, annual US board monitor report. And here's the really, really juicy part. Women made up 45% of new appointments up from 41% in 2020 the gender balance of Fortune 500 boards has steadily shifted the last several years, with women accounting for 29% of boards up from 19% in 2015. Mm -hmm. So a 10% lift in seven years. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot going on there with those statistics, of course. Um, I also have an R&D background. So when you're looking at data, you always have to think about what the numbers behind the numbers. Um, so you notice that it's 45% of new appointees. So we still have a long way to go, especially as I'm sure with the employment numbers right now, women make up over 50% of the workforce. So if you think about that from a perspective, um, you know, and there's a lot going on behind that, you know, what, what, what the, how that breaks down. But if you think about that, then really moving boards towards 50-50 makes a lot of sense just from that statistic. Um, in addition, there's been a lot of research done on boards that have two or more women on them versus ones that have zero. And uh, consistently, just from an ROI perspective, uh, the returns on investment, the uh, annual revenue, like the financials are just incredible. When you have two or more women on the boards, you, there's more success. The company is much more successful. And, um, and that research, I mean, it's from like the World Economic Forum, it's from Catalyst, it's from a number of sources. So this, these, these are real numbers. And when you start looking at that and think of how, you know, stakeholders, specifically shareholders, are having more and more of a voice at the table when it comes to running companies from a higher level strategic or board area, you have to think that they're going to want that board to be the best it can be. You're creating a team that you want to be successful, Olympic level, amazing. And if, if, if having exceptional finance is what you want, 
then of course you're going to want to make sure you have, have at least two women on the board. Yeah, so we're not just paying lip service to this. No. We're not just saying, you know, like the photo ops for the high school yeah. yearbook. It's it's not that. This is a no. financial ROI on this decision. This is becoming an employer of choice. A, mm. a, a oh, that's a whole nother area. <laughs> <laughs> well, or or a company that can just do better in the stock market if yeah. if that's the game they're playing. If they're a public company. Right, you you want to yeah, and and to your point as well. I mean, one of the largest issues that's hitting upper management, whether it's the C-suite or the board level right now, is employee engagement and employee retention. If you want to attract top talent, if you want to keep your top talent, if you want to keep your employees, then you need to show them at the C-suite level, at the board level, that you represent not just them, but that you have their best interest at heart. And, um, and that's, I'm trying to think who was talking about that. Um, there was another study done that employee retention, I think it's, it's something pretty high and like, like 80%, it's like 60 to 80% of employees that were um, in the study, uh, re, you know, asked whether or not they would stay with the company the ones that would tended to have at least one woman on the board. Mm -hmm. And you start seeing statistics like that when, you know, human capital, like human resources are the most important so thing expensive. right now. Okay. That's, that's a different topic. Right. This is what I'm that. saying. I'm like, we okay. can go down a few that, roads here. Yeah, There's that's, a lot behind all of this. That's its own conversation. I'd love to have you back if you wanted to riff on that, but let's dive oh, yeah. into this board thing. Mm -hmm. We've, We've shown that there are new women on boards, women, the membership on boards is increasing. Mm -hmm. There's some legislative push to make this happen. So as a woman, I can't imagine participating in that kind of board, but you're dying to do it. And you went yes. through a certification process to be board qualified. What did that entail? Um, well, if you look at what board services, it's um, it's primarily two things. It's oversight of the management, so hiring, firing the CEO, um, and um, more importantly, it's uh, providing that higher level advisory and strategy. And in order to do that, you need to really have a holistic understanding of business, and be willing at times to get into the weeds. Um, I actually really enjoy going into a PNL and figuring out how which lines in you know the financial documents link up to performance or how that's going to impact um, you know the brand or what type of marketing we should be doing or you know which areas of M and A we should be exploring. So it's it's really having a holistic view um, where you can have the oversight of the entire strategy of a company and what their mission is and being able to tie that directive to all the stakeholders and then to be able to get the, um, the results of that by having that good advisory to the C-suite, to the leadership team. Okay, so let's dive into the juicy part of the inner game of a woman who's been successful in her career, is highly qualified, might have always had this idea is like, ooh, if I were on the board, here's what I'd do. Or she saw some decisions from the top that were just a train wreck and she's like, I could do better than that. Um, <laughs> what, what do you think would inspire a woman to want to do that or would mm. potentially hold her back? What did you see in your cohort? Yes, and um, so the cohort you're talking about, it's um, ACE LLC runs a training for, uh, to create very strong candidates for boards of directors. Um, this is Michelle Ashby, she's lovely. You should have her on the show, she's fantastic. Um, and the what she did in her research she found that women and this is you know this is probably another statistic that you know from your you know career and employment work is that women will apply to jobs when they have 100 percent of the qualifications men 
will apply to jobs when they have 60% of the qualifications. It's just a different mindset and women will shy away from those leadership roles because they don't feel they have all the qualifications. Whereas really optimally, you probably wanna hire someone who has close to, but not all of the qualifications because you want them to get their skin in it. You know, basically to grow and, and become stronger um, with the role and to advance because if they have all the qualifications, they can do the job, they may not stay that long. So you want someone who's gonna be able to have uh, an opportunity to grow and be inspired by that role. Um, so that's, I think, what one of the things that's holding women back is they don't feel that they're qualified when really they are. Um, they really are, more are than aren't um, from that perspective. And in terms of who would want to do the work, again, I, I found the women in my cohort excited about the work, especially once they had the opportunity, because they're all in their own industries, they're all in their own fields, they've got their own jobs, they may not necessarily be privy to everything that happens at a board level. But then to have been given the opportunity to really understand it in a very intense course, and they will all say that. This was not what I would call easy <laughs> or light work. Um, this is not finishing school for no, executives. No, 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 no. There was a <laughs> lot of homework, a lot of meetings in between sessions. It was, yeah, it was, it was very thorough, and there was a very extensive test at the end to be to get certified. So this is very thorough, um, and and that's important because you want a candidate to go into the board ready to work and ready to work hard and ready to give their best. Um, so yeah, so I think the women who are interested, they find the work exciting and they find the purpose in it because by guiding these companies towards success, strengthening the, you know, not just the company or the industry, but the economy by doing this work, it's really, I, I feel it's a calling and many of the women in my cohort felt the same way. They felt an obligation to make their industries better, to make these companies better. That was really helpful to get into the mindset, but I'm gonna ask Susan, cause I know she must've been chomping at the bit when she heard the part about women need to have a hundred percent and guys will apply for things when they have 60%. I know you coach high performing women. What do you see around this? I see exactly what Heather has said where women will hesitate, at least the women that I've spoken to and worked with they they hesitate from putting themselves out there, like you said, because they feel like they lack something that they acknowledge that some of the men that they work with, they don't necessarily have it either, but they are willing to put themselves front and center and go for it. Whereas um, I've, I've worked with some women in the C-suite who will say, I am embarrassed that I still feel like I lack something that I know that I have. I know that I'm smart enough to be in the room, but I still don't feel 100% empowered to be there. Like I deserve to be there. And I, th I think that that's happening at all levels. It's not just someone who's just starting out and sort of finding her way. There are women who carry that all the way up as far as they are and they're, they're still they're embarrassed to even say it out loud and acknowledge it but i think a lot of us are still are still feeling that way i, I can i can tell you with 100 percent certainty they are because i've talked to them and i've talked to women executives who have billion dollar pnls and they still struggle with this imposter syndrome or well i understand this really well but it, the, the numbers part kind of throws me a little bit or um you know, there's some part of it that's a little wobbly for them. And then that one little bit seems to say, oh, no, I couldn't do that. You were with, uh, Heather, a bunch of women who are highly qualified, very successful in their career, and they still still struggled with um, feeling occasional feelings like, what am I doing? Is anyone going to take me seriously? I'm going to go through this course. Is anybody going to offer me a board position? How am I going to do this? What was some of the advice that came out either from the group within itself or from the leadership of the group is how women could step forward and, and claim this? That's, uh, that's so true. Yeah, this was a very impressive group of women. I mean, many, um, many PhDs, 
uh, many people with higher level degrees um, who had been running massive companies or, and were in the C-suite. So yes, these are exactly what you were talking about, Susan. The, they very much had the, why me? Why, why would I be able to do this? How could I, I why am I even here? Um, so I, I want to hear what Susan has to say for this question too, because I, I think there's a, as much good advice as can be given around this. Um, the better. So uh, a lot of the advice that we got was, you know, primarily take time to recognize what you have accomplished. When you are, you know, a high powered driven individual who uh, works for success, you don't always take the time to write down your successes, to acknowledge them and, and think of it almost like um, capturing what I would call resume bits. You know, so when you do accomplish something, um, the recommendation was to have a file or, you know, physical or, or digital um, where you put this information. Um, one of the things I do, I have in my calendar um, on certain days um, that repeat every single week. Um, I have one that's specifically how to make my business more successful. So when I come across something really amazing that I'm like, I need to remember this, I'll put it there. I have other ones for successes. I have a specific thing in my calendar once a month that's on repeat. So I continue to add successes to it so that if I'm having a day where I need to remember that, <laughs> I go to that and remember it. Um, so just recognizing your successes, um, I think was one of the ways. And another way that worked very well was understanding that if you don't know something, something that's okay because you can learn it. And more importantly, at that higher level or when you've been in business that long, you normally know the right person to go to to ask the right question. And that level of networking takes time, but is exceptionally valuable. So those would be the two things I would say. Susan, I want to hear your answer to this. Me too. Well, well, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Being able to write down your successes and your strengths and looking at that often just reminds you of how far you've come and how much you have to offer. And then what I would add to that is being willing to say, okay, what what are you thinking about? You know, what's going on in your head? What beliefs do you hold around why you don't feel like you belong in the boardroom? And let's unpack some of that because some of that thinking and those beliefs can go way back. And women are often surprised to say, I can't believe that I feel that way about women's role in society. You know, some women very high on the food chain might feel deep down inside that they are there to support men. Um, I have a friend who tells a story about she finally got onto the executive committee, an all male executive committee, and she walked in the room and the president looked at her and said, hey, so and so do us a favor, can you take notes today. And instead of saying something about it, she sort of fell into that role and afterwards she pushed back and said, I'm, I'm just curious, why did you ask me. And he said, because any meeting we're in, whenever you take notes, you do it the best, it's most thorough. And she, she struggled being in that role for a while. And then finally, one day she got into the meeting and she said, hey guys, I, I think we should all take turns or we should bring someone in who's willing to take notes for us. And she was finally willing to stand, stand up, but she didn't even realize until that moment that she was, she was allowing herself to fall into that role because on some level she felt that that's the role that she should play. And being willing to look at things in a different way and go, I don't have to play this role. I can step in and I can be equal with everybody else sitting in the room, sometimes we have to go in and we have to unpack what's really driving us to shrink, to not speak up, to not fully be confident in a situation when we know that we deserve to be there. Or we know intellectually that we deserve to be there, but there may be some gremlins in our subconscious that poke their head up occasionally and say, who do you think you are? <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? You're going to get slapped if you show up. Like we, 
I, you know, I spent half of middle school in the hallway because I know this is going to shock you. I was a bit of a smart ass. So, <laughs> <laughs> so if, if I were going for that kind of role, I could get, well, you know what? No one's going to take me seriously. I'm going to get shut out of the conversation. I'm going to get sent to the hallway. Or, you know, maybe even worse, if you were the bright, bubbly, articulate child who was always asking questions and stuff, your parents might have just only from exhaustion, not even from bad intent, might have been like, oh, my God, would you please just be quiet for a while? Heather has a whole brood, so she she may have experienced that <laughs> once in a, a, once bit, in a, a while. <laughs> but, but we do... I think it is important to look at what society tells us and what we may have personally experienced in our community or family of origin as women. Um, Heather, I know you do career transition stuff too. When people mm -hmm. are interviewing, this kicks up a bunch of I want to be seen. I want to get the job. I want to get the job offer. Oh my God, don't see me. I don't want to brag about myself. I don't want to promote myself. But I'm guessing this is the same thing in the board conversation. We want to step up. We want to ask to be considered. We want to make a recommendation if we're actually on the board. But oh my goodness, is anybody going to take me seriously? I'm going to going to get slapped down. Am I going to be humiliated in front of the board? I've had, you know, a bunch of times senior level people go off on me when I made suggestions in the room for whatever reason. What what do you see? Um, it's so interesting you talk about being able to brag about yourself, being able to, um, and I actually in my book, I have an entire section on how to do that, because I think we don't give ourselves permission, and it's one thing to say you should brag about yourself, it's another thing to give people the tools on how to do it. So like clear, simple steps, because it, in, in, and I specifically talk about for our career transitions, the interview process for that moment, because you have to brag about yourself. You are your only shot. Your entire sales team is you during that interview. And you have such a limited amount of time. And the interview process is so um, it's long and cumbersome out now. I'm, I'm hoping that this post pandemic, it will evolve to be something a little more gracious for everyone involved. It's, it's not right now. I think it's an evolution just a little bit. We can hope. Um, but that is something, uh, I definitely say it's hard to stand up for yourself. I will say part of the advice that we got during the course was to be prepared, mm -hmm. arrive early, do your homework and be prepared. And most people who get to that level, um, and Susie, maybe you could talk about this they're more prepared than they think they are. And they tend to be the type of people who do not go into meetings unprepared. So, mm -hmm. um, so really leaning back on that and understanding that you have a, a team of, we'll say information that you bring and to be confident in that um, can make all the difference. I have, I have a very good friend who was recently appointed president of a board and she's been she's played several roles on the board and just recently actually last week became the president mm -hmm. and we were talking over the weekend about it and it's like you said she has a laundry list of things of how you know what she wants to do she's very focused she understands the vision she you know she she's gone in she's incredibly prepared and super excited it's what you'd said earlier heather about you know the, the vision be you know you know you working towards the vision and the purpose of the organization and she's so excited about it and just brings an incredible energy and enthusiasm and curiosity to the role and she's incredibly prepared and I, there are a handful of other women on the board as well but having this role, you know, she feels a lot of pressure, but she's she's also excited to really lean in and and lead this board in an organization, lead the board and the organization in a way that has never been done before. I love that's, it. Oh, that's so wonderful. I, I want to chime in. One thing I tell clients in interviews, and and you know, you're interviewed for a board position, so it is an mm -hmm. interview process. I make it less about the bragging thing i take the emotion out of that and say if you don't give them the information that they need 
to come to the conclusion that you are the right candidate, you have done them a disservice. Oh, I like that. I like it's like a well written LinkedIn profile. You're not writing it about or for yourself. You're writing it for the person who's reading it. Yeah, exactly. But that takes mm -hmm. some of the squishy. Oh, I'm ugh, out for people. Oh, well, I'm just giving them the information that they need to come to the conclusion that I'm the right candidate. Okay, well, well, that makes perfect sense. And it's less about me. It's more about well. You could say me the consumer package good you know me the product or my value to the organization which i'm sure you talk to people about all the time it's not about you it's about what you can do for them more or less they'd like a happy employee but that's secondary to, <laughs> to the value you can provide them just it's just how it is folks <laughs>
Well, I, I just, I just want to just echo what Heather said, which is the servant leadership. And if, if this is something that um, a woman just feels pulled to, and I, and I really believe it's not something that we're checking off. It's something that we feel pulled to do, that there's a reason that you feel pulled for that. And if you feel pulled, but yet you say, I don't deserve to, to sit around that table or be in that role, you have to be willing to say, okay, what's really going on here? What am I afraid of? What do I need to clean up? What beliefs do I need to put down? And that might seem like an easy process. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not and it's messy, but if you feel pulled to serve and lead in that way, you are that, that resistance that you're feeling, that is, a, that is a, the call that yes, you need to do it. And you need to start figuring out what's going on and be willing to say and admit, I feel like an imposter here. I don't want to feel like an imposter here anymore. What can I do? How can I change? How can I look at the, this differently? And how can I, you know, how can I give my, myself permission to step into that? And just that, that lens of looking at it differently, you know, it, the energy that that produces it's it's so much bigger and and knowing that you're there because you want to serve it's a it, you're making it about others instead of yourself when you're saying i'm an imposter you're making it all about you when you're feeling pull, feeling pulled to serve okay then then you're meant to to explore that and it, you make it about other people and that, and that takes a lot of the pressure off and remember folks excitement and anxiety feel very similar in the body. So if you get this zzz feeling, that can be good. If you're excited, if you're curious, if it's, oh, go for it, as Susan said. Um, don't, don't let that stop you. Ask, if you don't, if you don't ask, you don't get. Like we, we need you. If you have, feel you have something to contribute, you probably do. So I'm gonna leave that there. Thank you so much, Heather, for joining us. Thank you as always, Susan, my glorious co-host. And this has been Evolving Working.